Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to bring you back to Luke today, and when I bring you to the scripture, hope is hidden but will be revealed. Sometimes you have a hope that's deep in your heart, and it takes pressure to expose it. How many of you know that gold does not often lie on the surface of the ground? You've got to dig for the good stuff, you know? And sometimes the hope that is uh, deep within us has to be exposed to very rough situations in order for that hope to be revealed and, and come and produce its fruit. And as we look at this portion of Scripture today, um, I, I want you to know that Jesus faced many kinds of people. Kind of two categories. Those who heard his word, responded to it, and received it, and those who heard it and go, Neow. Yeah, right, and opposed it. And those kinds of people often will oppose truth because truth, when it faces you, precious friend, and, and me too, when truth faces us, it often makes us uncomfortable because it begins to rattle and knock at the door that we have closed tightly, a door behind which we hide for our sense of security and comfort and if we were to open that door, would expose a fear or a weakness in us, and we don't want to expose that. But see, it's always safe in the presence of Jesus, always safe in the presence of the Lord. Because his intent for us is to deliver us and set us free from anything that would hinder us in life. And so the Lord approaches us with his word, and, and his word begins to move within us to bring us to where he wants us to be. Well, in the day of Jesus, it's just kind of like today. Uh, people make comparisons. And when you begin to get close to truth, people will normally sideline you and go off and tell some other story, some local news thing that happened or something from their experience or their life. And exactly that's going to happen right here. Um, there was a story that was going about that day, and it was actually true, and, and uh, various uh, forms of that had occurred where authorities had come against some priests. In one instance, 3,000 priests were offering sacrifices in the temple to the Lord. And as they were shedding the blood of the innocent animals, the, the sacrifices to God, the soldiers came in and slaughtered about 3,000 priests there on the temple floor, mixing their blood with the blood of animals. And so that story was going around, and, and everybody was kind of scratching their head going, well, whose fault was it? Who, who caused that to happen? Had they done something wrong? And you, you, know, you know that kind of stuff that goes on. But here, here in Scripture it says, verse number 1 of chapter 13 of Luke, there were present at that season some who told him about the uh, Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, you see, every time we try to get off the subject, Jesus brings us back on his subject. And aren't you glad that he, he does not tolerate foolishness, but he brings us back to truth gently, powerfully, wonderfully, because his desire is to, is to reveal to us something that will better us, something that will cause our faith to increase. Something to encourage or to build us up. And so Jesus answers and says to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? See, friends, we're, we're and I speak from my own heart and your hearts too, we're quick to judge situations. We look at someone who has had an accident or, or a sickness or whatever, our first inclination is what they do wrong. What they do wrong to deserve that? What did they do wrong? And, and probably that should not be the first question that comes to our heart and mind. It probably should be, Lord, help them in the midst of their difficulty. Help them, Lord, and give them your strength and your answers. And he says, so, so this group of Galileans that, that were slaughtered, um, do you suppose they were worse than everyone else? Things happen, guys. Things happen. Things occur sometimes just because circumstances in this world. Sometimes it happens because of the human frailty of our flesh. 
Sometimes it happens because Adam and Eve sinned and sin uh, drifted down through the years and there are still results of sin happening, even in the lives of Christians. Uh, you know, just because you get a cold, don't say the devil did it. It's just a rhinovirus, guys. <laughs> Makes you have a leaky nose and irritation and all that kind of stuff. Don't, you know, a demon's not in charge of all this stuff. You follow what I'm saying? Um, don't, don't go looking for blame because if, you, if something happens to you, I mean, examine your heart. Yes, that's fine and that's good. But don't get into self-accusation, searching for an answer that may not be available to you because you're human, something happened. Remember when Pastor Mike and, and Terry, and, and as they were in school, and they went mountain climbing, which they loved to do, and, and something happened, and it caught his uh, middle finger, and it ripped off the first knuckle, and it was not a happy moment. Did, 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 he, did, he, did he sin and that's why he lost his finger? No. Did he disobey God in some manner and that's why he lost his tip of his finger? No. What happened? Well, you can ask him and he'll say this. He'll say, I, I, I didn't mind the line right. I didn't mind the, what are, the calipers or whatever they call those things. Or I'll never be on the, hanging on the side of the mountain, by the way, just to let you know. But, but <laughs> God bless him. But they, but they did something wrong in, the, in, in, in what they had done for years and years, and it caught his finger and ripped it off. See, not a fault made an error. Not a fault, not a sin made an error. I want you to take that to your heart because, friends, Satan is the accuser of the brethren. And if he can get you to accuse another brother, oh, yeah, he likes that stuff. But even more importantly, if he can get you to accuse yourself, and get you or me to, to just feel horrible about us with an accusation that we believe and we live out, then, friend, he keeps us from the very power and the force of God who wants to come and set us free from everything. Amen? So just hear my heart this morning as we continue in this. And, and it says a little further, in verse number 3, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you all, all uh, likewise perish. Or how about those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them? Do you think that they were worse sinners than, than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you no, Jesus says, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. He's just simply saying, don't be quick to judge. Don't rush to judgment just because something happens to someone. And neither rush to judgment because something happens to you. Things happen. Do we have answers? Yes, the Lord is there. He can help us. He can bring healing. He can bring grace. He can bring deliverance. He can do all of those things and more. But the fact is, if you get into an accusatory mode, you, you stymie the action of God in your life to bring answer. After all, the Word says this, everything that is intended as evil against you, God promises, I will turn to your good. Wait a minute, I need to say that on this side of the pulpit. I said everything, everything intended as evil against you. God said, I will bring the good out of it. I will. It's kind of like the two little boys. They were twins. And for Christmas, you know, you can have an attitude problem, right? Needs to be adjustment. Well, for Christmas, I know this is a Christmas illustration, but hang on. I'm going to tell it to you in the middle of summer. Here we go. Two little twin boys, and uh, they, they had a beautiful, beautiful wrapped box. Gold ribbon, red paper, it was just absolutely gold. Wonderful, 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 wonderful. And they opened their boxes, and exactly the same gift was inside, and there were road apples inside. You may, country folk, road apples or horse manure. They're about as big as an apple, and they call them road apples. But anyway, in the box is a road apple, and, the, and a couple of them, and, and the one little boy says, Oh, no, I got nothing for Christmas. And oh, Jesus, it was bad. Oh, he felt so horrible. The other little twin, I mean twins, he opens the box, he sees the road apple, and he says, Daddy, where's the pony? Where's the pony? Road apple's got to come from somewhere. So see, look, whatever comes your way, know that in the middle of that is God's answer to bring you through it. 
That's serious stuff you can take to the bank, friends. This word says God cares for us. He loves us. He knows us. He knows the number of hairs upon our heads. And he is concerned to, out of every situation, bring his perfect answer to you and to me. So if you find yourself in a turmoil, say, where's the pony? Hallelujah. God's got the answer coming. Look with me a little further. Instead of judging situations like these people were doing, Jesus speaks this parable in verse number six. He says, he also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And then he said to the keeper of the vineyard, look, for three years I've come here seeking fruit on this fig tree and I find none. Cut it down. And why does it use up the ground? And, and see, what you have to understand is the common, there was a common story in that day, and it was this. Com you know how people say, uh, well, I'm going to go to town, knock on wood, or they say, I'm going to do this investment or whatever, knock on wood. It's an old English thing that people believed that uh, demons hid in trees. And if you knocked on wood, you would confuse their hearing while you were saying something good about yourself. And if the demons couldn't hear, they couldn't mess up your plans. So that's when you say something, you say, knock on wood. That's what that means. Well, here in this, in this case, the story was, the story was that if you had a, a tree, a, 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 a vine, a fig tree, a palm tree that wasn't producing dates, you could go out to it with a big axe, with a big axe. Last time I did this, this thing came unscrewed, so let me see what's happening here. Very good. You go out with a big axe and you stand in front of that tree or that vine or whatever and you threaten the plant, you're going to cut it down. It was as if the plant would hear your threat and go, I better produce. The common thought was you threaten plants and they'll produce. So though that's not true, that was the common belief in that day. People believed it. And so Jesus ties into something they believe to illustrate a point and he says, the guy has this uh, uh, tr uh, vine, whatever it was, plant, what did I say it was, fig tree. And he went out and he says, no fruit for three years. I'm going to cut it down. Why is it using up the ground? Verse number eight. But he answered and said to him, sir, uh, his servant said, sir, please let it alone this year until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well, but if not, after that, you can cut it down. And what Jesus was saying is that there is someone who cares so much that even when you're not producing at the level that you think you should, Christians, I'm talking to your hearts this morning, even when you think you're not being effective, even when you think you're not producing what you need to produce in the kingdom of God, here's a gracious heavenly father that says to you, I'm going to dig a little deeper. I'm going to fertilize just a little bit more. I'm going to call upon those around you to come and assist and help you. And I'm going, I'm going to believe that you will produce the fruit which I've called you to produce. Friend, if I could come around to each of you this morning and shake my finger in your, in your face, I would say, don't give up. Don't give up. But I've blown it, Pastor. Don't give up. But I've been involved in this, that, and the other, Pastor. Don't give up. Well, pastor, I, I, I've treaded water for so long, I don't know what's going to come about. Don't give up. Do not give up. If the master is willing not only to die for you and shed his blood and invest his life for you, friends, he who has called you and started a good thing in you will complete it in Christ Jesus. Don't give up. But I've not achieved my dreams yet. Don't give up but I've not gone as far as I thought I would have. Don't give up. The master knows how to dig around you and fertilize you and bring help to you because he is determined, listen to me carefully, he is determined to produce fruit that remains, lasts in your life. And God, what he sets out to do, will accomplish it in the anointing of the Holy Spirit because of Jesus Christ. Don't give up. Don't give up. 
well, you know, God, this, that, and the, don't give up. Don't give up. Look a little further, please. And now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity, 18 years, was bent over and could no way raise herself up. Now, if, if you've ever had a broken limb and they set it for six weeks or so and finally you come out of that, you know that your, your, your muscles need to learn to cooperate again. Inside muscles probably have shriveled. Outside muscles have been stretched. And it's a difficult thing as you go through therapy to learn again to, to work in cooperation with that arm, that leg, whatever it might be. And the fact of the matter is this woman is bent over. Luke, who is a physician, is very careful when he speaks of conditions to identify them as either demonically influenced or just because of nature, just because of our human frailty. And so, precious friend, not everything can you blame on a demon. And everybody said, Amen. yeah, because there are people that do. I assure you, I've met them, I've pastored them, I've loved them, I've taught them. Some have changed their theology and some have insisted on a demonic theology. Friends, if you're going to glorify demons, guess what? They'll show up and manifest more for you. Just the way it is. But if you're going to glorify God, he's going to accomplish his purpose in your life. Amen? And so here is this woman bent over. And Luke the physician somehow discerns as a believer that this is demonically influenced. It's not simple physical condition. Also, because of this, 18 years in one position, we have doctors in the house and they can tell you, if you bent over like that again, you've, you've lengthened some muscles, you've shortened others, and the miracle is not only the release from her condition, but the miracle also involves correcting those shortened muscles and shortening those lengthened muscles so that she could stand aright. Would, 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 you, would you see that? There are layers, more layers to a miracle than a simple part of the miracle it's done. There are deeper layers. I'm telling you about a God who cares so much that he, he did, will go to the furthest extent to meet the need in your heart and your life. Aren't you glad you serve a God like that? And so it says here in this place, she's been over 18 years, could no wise raise herself up. But when Jesus, verse 12, um, saw her, he called her to him and said, woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. He doesn't go over and do a chiropractic move on her. He doesn't go over and say, stand up, woman, get over it. He speaks to her and he says, you're loosed from your infirmity. Then he lays his hands upon her and immediately she was made straight and she began to glorify God. Now you would think, if that happened in this house like this, everybody would be dancing in the aisles going, woohoo, look what the Lord has done, right? And, and you would think that joy would be in the house. But watch this carefully. Watch this. And it says, um, but the ruler of the synagogue, God bless the authorities. Ah, Jesus. Some authorities, I think, need a, a come to Jesus meeting. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, see, you see, a person who opposes Jesus always has an audience. Hello? If you're going to say something bad about the church, speak to yourself. <laughs> Don't hurt other hearts and lives. Amen? If you've got somebody who, who, who has torqued your jaws, don't go around spreading stuff about them. Keep it to yourself. Pray. You know, take it to God. Hey, that's an idea. Take it to the Lord. He'll probably help you see how maybe you can assist instead of damage. Oh, I'm just saying. Well, let's go on. The ruler of the synagogue, he says to the people, well, there are six days on which men ought to work and therefore come and, and be healed on them, but not on the Sabbath day. He's giving an announcement in the middle of a miracle. Wow. Come six days a week. Healing is here. On the Sabbath, don't bother. Because it's God's day. Ah. How ridiculous that sounds. Verse 15, the Lord then answered him and said, Hypocrite, two-faced person. You say one thing, you mean another. You can't even get it right. Hypocrite, does not each of you on the Sabbath lose his ox or 
loose his ox or donkey from the stall, lead it away to water it. Now see, technically that's considered working. But he said, you're not so foolish as to leave the animal in there all day without food or water. You lead it out to its watering place. And, and, and he said, so ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham who's Satan, whom Satan has bound, think of it now, for 18 years be loose from this bond on the Sabbath? Should it not be in the house of the Lord where people find answers? Should it not be in the house of the Lord where people discover that God cares and understands? Should it not be that here is where the answers of God can be exposed? Hear the word of the Lord. And then notice when he says this in verse 17, all his adversaries were put to shame and all the multitude rejoiced for all the glorious, glorious things that, God, that were done by him. You see, when God shows up, hungry people rejoice. When God shows up, people who oppose the truth because it might expose their hearts, they get all riled and rankled. See, when truth approaches you, it says to you and it says to me, realign your, your, your priorities. When truth shows up, it knocks on the door of my hidden compartment and yours. When truth shows up, Jesus goes, would you open that cupboard, please? Would you open that closet door, please? Would you open that place that you have hidden, please? Why? Because I want to get in and heal you. Where the fear tries to rule, I want to go and bring healing in you. Friends, I'm telling you today, hope may be hidden, but circumstances will come and knock on your door and try to expose that hope you have in Jesus Christ. Friends, don't let fear, don't let fear minister binding authority in your life. Come to faith, re 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 reject the fear that tries to rise in our hearts and come to faith in the Lord. Watch this a little further, please. And it says this in verse 18, then he says, what is the kingdom of God like? What shall we liken it to? And to what shall I compare it? It is like a mustard seed which a man took and put in his garden. It grew and became a large tree, and the birds of the air nested in its branches. God is saying in the tiny little mustard seed is all the code to make a huge, giant, a huge and gigantuous plant that the birds can come and nest in. Friend, I tell you in the word of God, though you may think it's minuscule in your heart and life, is all the power and the authority of heaven to bust the doors out of your difficulties and bring your answer. In the midst of the word of God, in the midst of the presence of the Lord, is his ability to set you free. In the middle of the deepest, darkest situation, rejoice because that which has been intended as evil against you, God has planted right in the middle of it his plan to turn it to your good. Every time something goes squirrely, go, woo, where's the pony? Every time the pressure comes, go, oh, my God, the answer is on the way. Satan says, be depressed and fearful. And you go, no, I don't have time for that stuff. I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. Every time everyone says to you, hey, you have no cause to rejoice in this. It's a bad situation and looks like it's getting worse. Go, no, 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 no. I rejoice in the Lord. He is my rock. He is my strength. He is my confidence. He is my hope. He is my all in all. I will go through because God has decreed it. I will go through. Friend, I'm telling you, God has your best in mind. That's where it is. Mustard seed's not much. And then he says it again to emphasize in verse 20. Again, he says, to what shall I liken the kingdom of God? It's like leaven or yeast, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. Some of you ladies have made bread. Some of you guys too. I, I use the bread machine. Put it in, forget it. There it is. Good stuff. Anybody still using bread machines? I haven't for years. But anyway, bread is wonderful. But you have that big doughy thing, Majiri. The yeast is in it. You put it in the pan. You put the, the thing on the top, and it goes in a while. And then you punch it down, and you wrap it up, and you undo it, and put it back in there, and cover it over. And, it goes, and you 
that little sticky lump has become now something marvelous. And you make two or three loaves and everybody goes, oh, homemade bread, great, hallelujah. How did it get there? It would have been a big, bad, square cookie if you hadn't put leaven in it because leaven causes it to grow, right? And Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like that. Listen to me. You and I are human beings. We're made of the dust of the ground. And yet what resides within us as believers is the very life and essence of God. And what he calls life and what he calls forth his plan, he develops in us and through us that which changes history and alters the course of things ahead of us because somebody listened and said, yes, Lord. Somebody saw the impossible situation and yet knew the God of glory made all things possible to him that believed. And they rose in the most holy faith and God did miracle after miracle because somebody believed. Is that somebody you? You say, well, well, I'm not much. Who told you that lie? I can't do much. What? What's up with you? It is God who has called you. It is God who has forgiven you. It is God who has enabled you. It is God who will embolden you. It is God who will put His grace and His power and His authority in you. Why? Because the dreams and the visions that God has placed within your life are for His purposes to accomplish great things. And when you and I think we can't, God thinks He can through us as His vessels. Friends, don't discount small beginnings. There was a minister many years ago, Mordecai Ham. maybe some of you have heard of him, never pat pastored more than 30, 35 people. A little country preacher, he preached the fire out of the Word of God, loved the people that he served, and he preached diligently and faithfully years and years and years, and someone would come and talk to him. And he'd say, well, I have a scripture for that, kind of remind me of Chaplain uh, Perry Miller. And he'd go, uh, well, this scripture says, that, and he would share like that all the time, didn't think he was successful at all as an elderly man. Did not think he had much success. 30, 35 people, that was the biggest his congregation ever got. But amongst his congregations that, that went through his little church was a young man by the name of Billy Graham. Billy Graham was saved in that little congregation. And Billy Graham went on to hear the call of God and change the world for the face of Christ. I, I, I tell you, friend... The fruit of the man's faithfulness, speaking to the 3035, became that which caused this world to stand up and take notice. <sighs> Don't discount that which God has planted within you. I'm almost done here this morning. Look a little further, please, in verse 22. And he went through the cities and villages teaching, journeying towards Jerusalem. Look, God's going somewhere. You're going to go with him? Remember the old phrase, um, someone said one day, a comedic kind of a deal, said, uh, where are you going? The answer was, I'm going crazy. Want to come with me? Remember that? Jesus says to us, I'm in heaven. I'm going I'm to come from my place to your place and take you back to my place. You coming? You coming? For eternity's sake. My, my, my answer and our answer is to be, yes, Lord, we're going to go with you. And so Jesus is coming through, teaching, journeying. He has an ultimate goal, Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, he's going to be taken by evil men. He's going to be accused. There will be about six illegal uh, trials all night and early morning. He will finally be beaten and, and his back shredded. He'll be nailed to the tree. There he will uh, give up the ghost and die. He'll be taken down. He'll be buried in three days, rise again. Why did he look forward to such an, an ignoble ending? Because he knew through the death of the cross, he would defeat the authority of death itself. The authority of hell. The authority of Satan himself. Friends, he knew that he would give us the victory because of his obedience. Let me tell you right now, you are someone's answer. God has assigned each of us as a miracle in process. There's somebody that needs your word. There's somebody that needs your encouragement. There's somebody that needs your input. There's somebody who'll listen to you when they wouldn't listen to mom and dad, aunt and uncle, grandma and grandpa, or anybody else or spouse. But they'll listen to you because they've not yet been inoculated to your voice. 
You are someone's answer. You are someone's miracle. You are someone's assignment from God that they may be given choice to avoid hell and find heaven forever through Jesus Christ. Oh my God, you're on assignment. Oh my God, you're so vital to the kingdom. Oh my God, some grandma, some grandpa, some mom and dad have been praying, God, get a hold of my son, my grandson, my granddaughter, my daughter. Get a hold of my niece, nephew, whatever. And God goes, you. You go, who, what, what, me? No, 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 no. Somebody's been praying, God, send answer. Somebody's been fasting and praying, God, send answer. God, send answer before my child, my grandchild, whoever it may be, before they hit the skids of hell. Oh, God, send answer. God gives you a little thing to go saying, you know, Jesus loves you, my friend. And just take them totally off guard and penetrated by the Holy Spirit and have them come to faith in Christ. Are you going to show up? Are you going to stand up? Are you going to speak up? You're going to be on time? I trust so. Because you're God's miracle in waiting for that moment when he says, yes, now is time. And you're not just a one-shot. Hey, friends, you are not a one-chambered gun. you got a magazine of bullets. Purposeful. <laughs> Purposeful assignments of the Lord in your magazine, so to speak. Oh, well, let's continue a little further. All right. And then, it, and then it says this, watch, verse 22, going to Jerusalem. Then one said to him, Lord, are there so few who are saved? Why, why that? Listen, and he said to them, strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock on the door saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. And he will answer and say to you, I don't know who you are. I don't know where you're from. And when, then you will begin to say, well, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I don't know you and where, where you are from. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. And there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and yourselves thrust out. And they will come from the east and the west, from the north and the south and sit down on the kingdom of God. And indeed, there will be there are those uh, last who will be first, and there are first who will also be last. He's simply saying this. He's saying to people, stop being judgmental. I know who are mine, and I'm bringing them in. Will you be part of that? Will you be part, not judgmental, but will you be open and useful in my hands? Verse 31, quickly, I'm about ready to close. On that very day, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get out and depart from here, for Herod wants to kill you. Herod was a real buzzard. I'm telling you, he was a real turkey. And he said to them, Well, go and tell that fox. I guess you can call names sometimes. Go tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons, perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. He's speaking about his, his time in Jerusalem where he's going to be killed and yet raised from the dead. Nevertheless, I must journey today, tomorrow, and the day following, for it cannot be the prophet should perish outside of Jerusalem. He just simply says, look, I've got a plan. The plan's going to be carried out. I don't care what Herod says. He cannot stop the plan of God. I'm telling you, look at your dilemma in the face and say, you can't stop God. Look at your dilemma and declare, you can't stop back up and stop God I'm going through Jesus is going and I'm going with him and it may be some tough times to go through but guess what I'll walk in his footsteps it'll be sure Amen. I wish I had time to preach this verse 34 oh Jesus begins to cry out oh Jerusalem Jerusalem the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her how often I wanted to gather your children together as him gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate, and assuredly I say to you, you shall not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus speaks prophetically in A.D. 70, some 40 years hence from this point, General Titus will come in and besiege the city of Jerusalem. And for a year or two, whatever, he will fight against that city till people are actually becoming cannibals behind the walls. 
And he says to them, listen carefully, please, as I close. He says to them, he says to them, it's coming a day. Are you going to be ready? Friends, coming a day for each of us when our lives will be forfeit. Will you be ready to meet the master? I'm not talking fear here. I'm talking about a God who loves you so much. He made a way for you and me to be his forever. So don't be ruled by fear. Be ruled by faith. Because God's got a plan. God's got a plan. Oh, I wish I had more time. I don't. This morning across the congregation, I just say to you, if, you, if God's speaking to your heart and says, you know what, now's the time, now's the day. You, need, you just need to surrender to the Lord. You need to find out what it's like to have someone who will never leave you nor forsake you. You need to find out about the one who will not ever, ever abandon you, but love you dearly. That might be you today. Has God spoken to your heart? If he has in that manner, you could just say by the uplifting of your hand, Pastor, that's me. I want to give it all to the Lord. I, I don't know everything you've said, but I, I do have a drawing in my heart towards Jesus. I, I just want to surrender my life to him. Are there those? Just raise your hand and say, pray for me, Pastor. I want to surrender my life to the Lord. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Let me put your hand down. Hallelujah. Are there others? All right, let's stand together. Hallelujah. We're going to pray a prayer of faith and, and committal this morning to him. Look, honestly, the decision's already been made. The decision's already been made by this precious one. And in the heart, Jesus is flooded in to bring life. But we're going to pray a prayer aloud. I'm going to ask one to raise their hands and all of us to pray this prayer together. Because maybe, maybe you were concerned and you didn't raise your hand. You should have. And um, this gives you opportunity. Would you just repeat this prayer after me, please? Dear Heavenly Father, I stand before you just as I am. And I ask you now, Lord, based upon your promise, forgive me of my sin. Make me your child because I believe in you, Lord. I believe you died for me. And I believe you raised from the dead for me. And I surrender my life to you. Make of me what you desire. And I will follow you the days of my life. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 Just let me say one last thing, please. I, I don't mean to go on and on. But the devil can't do a thing about it. Don't you love it? Woohoo! Glory! We're going to have people here to pray with people. If you need to place a prayer at the altar, or you need to come and, and have someone agree in prayer with you, please avail yourself of that ability. Tonight at Schlotsky's, we're just going to meet for fellowship at 5 o'clock. The youth are going to be at 6, and uh, it's going to be a good day. Would you just receive the pastoral blessing this morning as the Word instructs us? Church, may the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you peace. May he be gracious to you and may Holy Spirit powerfully move in your hearts and your lives to accomplish his purpose. And may you understand and realize the divine appointments God gives to you is because God trusts his power and ability and life in you to minister to those around you. In Jesus' name, go in the peace of God. Everybody said, Amen. God bless you.